Thank you everyone for joining the session uh, this morning, session one, and now we are starting our session two. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have Dr. Patrick Schumacher uh, opening the session. Patrick Schumacher is a principal at Zaha Hadid Architects. He joined Zaha Hadid in 1988 and was seminal in developing Zaha Hadid's uh, practice to become a 400 strong global architecture and design brand. Patrick uh, studied philosophy, mathematics, and architecture in Bonn, Stuttgart, and in London. Uh, he's received his diploma in 1990, and uh, he has been a partner since 2003 and a co-author of uh, all projects as Zaha did. So Patrick uh, has a long uh, tradition of uh, exploring possibilities in the realm of co computational design. Uh, and uh, there is a long list of contributions from uh, Dr. Schumacher. And uh, with no further ado, I'll just uh, pass the word to him uh, and uh, his current research. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, hi, Abel. Thanks a lot for generating this event and inviting me to it. Um, the research I will be presenting, you've seen a number of times as you joined some of our sessions. Um, I'm calling this talk Expanding Architecture's Core Competency. It's uh, moved on a little bit from the paper I'm delivering to the conference book, which is talking about operationalizing architecture's core competency. And you'll see what the difference is because I've been, I will not only share research uh, ongoing and achieved and in process, but also some ideas about the next expansion of that research project. Um, and I'm saying here ZHA and AADRL because some of the research is done um, at the AA and then uh, it's continuous in our own research groups. And then always the new stuff. I'm just starting now with AADRL and I show that at the end, the outlook of where I think we should take that uh, next. So, so I wanted to um, first start with the um, premise of all of this, that the societal function of architecture is the innovative ordering and framing of communicative interaction. It's important to uh, distill out the core competency and societal function of architecture versus other disciplines that often is confused with or mingled in with and historically was mingled in with, particularly with the engineering disciplines. Uh, so we are in charge of social functionality uh, and the technical functionality is something downstream with engineers. Of course, we're interested in uh, these engineering process and fabrication and construction to the extent that it is communication relevant. And of course, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sensuous um, um, presences and articulations of the built environment all the way down to um, tectonic details are communication relevant. That's why we remain interested in it, but our core competency doesn't lie there. So, uh, so I have want to offer these three theses. So the most general description of architecture's task is to provide order in ordering social processes, not shelter, which is uh, now more an engineering kind of job in terms of the physical uh, provisions. Architecture is responsible for social functionality, not technical functioning. Uh, I had that mentioned already, but uh, what is also important that this order is recently at least, and the more society progresses, mostly delivered by communicated demarcations and let's say designation rather than physically enforced via physical boundaries, which is, um, still exists, but I think uh, we're trying to move away from that. And it's a kind of uh, residue rudiment or an element of regressiveness is, is kind of physical enforced demarcations, uh, let's say would reemerge. So I want to use this, these images as an analogy. So you can see you can actually order an, an interaction process like kind of a, a sports field, competitive sports field with uh, not with wars, but with these kind of territorialization and demarcations. And um, so that's what I want to look at architecture. And it's a, you can see here, it's an ordering, but also it's a semiology in each different territory, different rules of interactions, or let's say interaction protocols uh, at, Apply, and what you can also see in that analogy here, so that yeah, the different zones, different rules of interaction apply, but you also have a, a the various users are differentiated 
with respect to various uh, teams' rights, you know, the referee, goalkeeper, players of different teams, etc. And that's typical. And there are also kind of they have designed uh, outfits which demark, uh, which which designate that those functions. And we do that as well. And it's all part of the design discipline. So I'm talking about the totality of the built environment and world of artifacts, including dress, etc., as being the realm of design which uses spatial visual language to structure social interaction and make, uh, let's say, sophisticated, goal-oriented collaboration possible. And therefore, it's, it's a huge aspect of the prosperity engine of societal processes, which gives us a degree of freedom of a huge level of prosperity we've achieved. So you can see here, I'm comparing this to some uh, you know, old Ch Chinese renderings. And this has been always the case that we have social interaction framed and differentiated through spatial demarcation, ornamentation, and morphological uh, and semiological uh, differentiation. And so that is a system of differences. So we can't essentialize an individual, um, let's say, form or shape, but it's a system of difference. So these four designs of a chessboard, one of them, by the way, the Zadid architects. Uh, there are, um, in terms of the information content and semiological, um, let's say, manifold equivalent, we could start to criticize them in terms of legibility, ease of differentiation, etc. So there still remain, um, so there's a lot of degrees of freedom in articulating the built environment. Um, um, there is this kind of arbitrariness uh, within a semi-logical system, which, which, which is, of course, only a layer of an ultimate systematicity and set of constraints and functioning constraints. So, so I'm going to talk a bit about architectural semiology as uh, being at the heart of architecture's core competency. And I um, just want to show you that I've been, I could have shown some of our projects where we have, where we use um, nearly in every building there is uh, no maybe less consciously articulated a series of key distinctions marked by, by, by location, morphology, and ornamentation. I want to show you briefly this kind of project when it becomes complex and dense and multi-layered with, 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 with gradient differentiations and, and the dynamism in, involved, it becomes more complex and worthy uh, to, to systematize the project. So I'm going to walk you through that a, a project like this has an intricately um, designed uh, vocabulary and grammar and is actually system systematically developed as a semiological project. And uh, that doesn't mean that it isn't kind of phenologically and sensuous, sensuously present that actually enhances the intuitive instant legibility. So, so basically like with the chessboard, we, we, were, we were working with of course systems of distinctions and they're kind of hierarchically nested, but they also allow for um, um, variation within categories as well as gradient um, uh, spectra and in-betweening. So, so in this case, this is a corporate environment, a corporate campus or a corporate building, and we can distinguish broadly uh, all the kind of business uh, workspaces, very broadly defined and distinguishing from, uh, let's say, circulation, leisure, and spaces, etc. And I'm using here the distinction bound versus unbound. So the openly flowing and, and unbound spaces, all those, let's say, informal interaction spaces, which include circulation and potentially the in invasion of the public. And all spaces which have a closed boundary of one kind or another would be the business space. So that's the primary distinctions. So we go then within the business uh, spaces, all the bound spaces, I'm distinguishing here workspaces versus meeting spaces. And this is about the con any concave kind of amoeba space um, uh, um, articulates uh, work zones um, and uh, the meeting space are always convex. And you can see here that within these categories, there's an enormous amount of var variability. So the kind of parametric uh, um, versatility of articulation remains uh, intact. So these are all um, uh, either easily identified, even though they're kind of different, they share something. Um, and of course, these across this boundary, they share that they're all bounded. Now, in the bottom, you can see here, there's, a, there's you can also make a kind of in-betweening between a kind of concave and a convex. 
And that makes sense if there was um, an in-betweening or certain ambiguity where, where um, let's say concentrated work zones kind of graduate institutions and situations might gradually kind of bleed into meeting situations, communicative situations. So, so there's, uh, if they're socially a gradient, we should in the architectural language offer a formal gradient. So, so it's important that we could then have use, this is the vocabulary, we can use grammar where we build up complex communications, meaning a whole space with multiple um, um, communications nested and clustered to make an overall broadcast and system, let's say the way you build up sentences into a text. And I'm starting with not words, but with sentences. So the minimum unit of a semiological uh, a project would be some kind of um, territory. So territorialization, not necessarily through a boundary, might be through an object, which makes a difference with respect to defining a situation. So if you're moving from one situation to another, uh, so it's always a, a space which can be occupied. I'm entering one situation versus another, however much articulated, that's the minimum unit of a architectural communication, not a, a motif, a feature, a fragment, like it's the, the sentence rather than the word. And we, of course, we also have words which make up sentences. We have elements which territorialize and, and characterize a, a, a zone as a situ allowing for particular social interaction and not for others. That's always the differences that makes a difference. So what I want to show here, grammar can be built up. So you can actually build up a complex where you have um, a convex nesting with concave. And this makes a lot of sense. You have most meeting and workspace. You can also nest uh, to um, uh, workspace and the overall still a workspace, but you can also intersect. And I think that's important for the level of complexity and layers of contemporary social situations where you have domain competency overlaps. You don't have kind of neat hierarchies and separations. We have territories bleeding into each other, overlap multiple encoding, multiple reference. So what do you do if you overlap two workspaces? The overlap zone might be yet another a workspace with a shared between, let's say, two, these two teams is overlap in another kind of shared workspace, for instance. And you, but you can also overlap two workspaces and generate a meeting space, or you generate an overlap of a larger meeting space with a workspace and generate a smaller meeting space. So, so in these combinatoric building up, this grammar works. So that's not guaranteed. You have to kind of work through that the the way you play with these forms and the way they aggregate into complex of forms that there is a system, the, system, the systematic readings carry through. So you have to craft a grammar which works in terms of um, the semantic meaning. So these are all kind of semantically tagged environments. And the next thing, I'm gonna go here through that, when you then go into furnishings, you might have amoeba form desks which become uh, work desks and you have um, a, a convex, forms, circle, uh, et cetera, for meeting desks. So you, go, you bring that also into the, in, in all, deep into the uh, structuration of the uh, environment. Lighting elements might uh, enhance that equally. So now we're looking at how you're building up a territory. So we have the grammar, we have the overall also distribution where we can, for instance, start with the unbounded zones on one side and the bound ones and the unbounded bleed through. But we can also then look at the overall shift and gradient from a largely unbound into a largely bounded set of territories with, and you can even have these workspaces suddenly opening up and that becomes, that means that they are less strictly work, they're kind of socializing, meeting with working uh, and, and so on. So, so there's also the, the possibility uh, socially and architecturally in this project and in the languages we kind of build to um, have in betweening on that global level. And the next uh, thing is how you kind of read these situations and you have an overall order. And the next thing is also, uh, we'll show later that these things can start to rotate and shift. And there is kind of kinetic transformation possibilities where something transforms and in every state and stage, it is remains a kind of clear broadcast message uh, in, in the system. So again, and then you can see how this starts to be detailed. What is this boundary might not be a, a wall. It might just be a kind of a step, a set of steps, which we get, gains its own functions. 
Uh, so these are permeable, they're visual thresholds rather than kind of physical barriers. Um, and visual communication goes across, but they still give you a sense of territory and intimacy. You can see here the, the, the articulation of desks, ceiling features, etc., etc. So that's what I'm going to show you how we are reading these environments. Now, I want to also, so that language was, let's say, parametrism, uh, early parametrism, nerve surfaces, etc., applied. But the latest stage of parametrism, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, the way I'm talking about is tectonism. You see all the kind of integration of fab new fabrication technologies, engineering logic, sophisticated like topology optimization. There's a lot of morphology enrichment. We're no longer working just with, with nerve surfaces. And this is, for me, uh, on the one hand, it means that you can um, execute and fabricate in time and economically a lot of these complex forms we now desire, and as I showed you in my project before, become kind of uh, socially hyperfunctional. but we can also, it becomes, for me as architect, also a new palette of articulation. Uh, it's not usually what the authors uh, of tectonism um, think about, but really this is about, uh, again, enhancing the palette for semiological articulation. So if you look at that new world, very different, I call it the latest stage, the most advanced mature phase of parametricism. It still has all the, let's say, in the room to rehearse them, principles and categories and, and taboos and heuristics, uh, uh, positive and negative heuristics um, of parametricism at play, but I think it's much more as that then. You can see the kind of richness of materiality, of morphology, of articulation, and you can see using the factura and relishing in that, and that becomes a very, very rich semiological repertoire, but of course it needs to be done ordered and brought to bear. And I just want to show you these pavilions from Afimengas. They're not thinking about semiology, but you can construct these networks of similitude and, 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 and differentiation. So it's important that you can kind of bring things together, for instance, here through materiality, which are on some dimensions similar and other dimensions uh, dissimilar because there's are certain features that certainly maybe they overlap in certain con conditions. You can do that both across uh, uh, and, uh, and vertically, so there's similarity and difference at play in all directions. So that's also something where, where let's say, this repertoire of tectonism should be systematized and brought into a vocabulary and then a grammar. So the next point in this is, those, okay, we, we can design such, but at the level of complexity and nuance, in terms of the programmatic designations and zoning, how are we actually dealing with this? Is it simply a list of stereotypical uh, let's say, um, uh, brief categories, uh, uh, which, which come usually the brief, or is it something more complex? Is it, is it not a dynamic, uh, parametrically variable event scenarios with a lot of agents um, 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 and a lot of nuance in, in all these different situations which we differentiate? So that brings me to, when it becomes complex, I need to bring in, I think, what I call life process modeling, and it becomes agent-based parametric semiology uh, and that's the name, the title of a three year long research project, which now kind of moves into the next stage, in fact. So we started at the AA, um, let's see if that runs. You can see here, if you have this, you designate a number of territories and you can show what it means because the crowd, the users will, 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 the, these thresholds make a difference. Differences that make a difference in terms of interaction, that's the social meaning of these spaces become clear and operationalized. So you bring the meaning, the semantic uh, meaning into the model if you start running these crowds and these zones and, and morphologies and maybe color coding make a difference for behavior, it becomes clear. And then it also you start to see the functionality advantages of a such similarly structured environment. Um, where we can exploit the ability of users, of course, to see these differences and then retrieve and, and switch the kind of action uh, a menu which becomes relevant here. So, so we've done that. And um, so we, we do these simulations also with respect to, let's say, our own offices. And you see these, these zones are sometimes not necessarily demarcated in the, in, the, in the ground, they're through, through an arch where you move through in the various settings, furnishing settings, they're all kind of semantically tagged. There's a difference in terms of interaction mode with a meeting table, a, a couch, a, a bar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so that is what we're going for. 
And uh, we're doing these uh, uh, models now in um, Unity or Unreal. We actually doing them in Unity. And so there's a, there's a kind of interesting technology transfer from the gaming world. Uh, where we have obviously filling uh, gaming spaces and virtual spaces with with autonomous agents who, who could be quite differentiated and varied. So that's the operationalization of architectural semiology, and um, so and it's clear that there's a, there's quite a difference between these what I call architectural life process simulations in comparison to engineering crowd models, which are based on basically physical throughput circulation mostly, maybe initially evacuation, now it's kind of circulation and and much, not much more so far, not the full spectrum of occupancy activities and, and human interaction in various uh, situations, who you approach, you don't approach, or how long you strike up a conversation. So the, 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 the difference here is on the conceptual level that we're conceptualizing user as socialized actors rather than mere physical or physiological bodies. Which need to, you know, which need to be sustained by a slab, floor slab, and where the corridor has to be wide enough that that, that a crowd pushes through, or where there's a kind of, let's say, a well uh, environmental temperature, etc. So, so we have um, socialized actors in mind, and that means we have the following augmentations or innovations in our crowd model. So, the, of course, it's the expansion of the behavior and action repertoire, which is very, very large. Uh, differentiation of the agent population. So, so we would look at a you know corporate crowd which has various levels of hierarchy, team structure, that has visitors, has consultants, um, and uh, various network affiliations. Who you know, who you work with, who you don't know, and all of that makes a difference for the realism, but also for the kind of change management opportunities. So it's a differentiation of the crowd rather than homogeneous crowds. Then, of course, very importantly, semiology means the designation dependency of behavior. So when the full wherever you move, um, there is a certain subset of action possibilities which become relevant that everybody who is entering that space would kind of home in on that subset. So you have an ordered interaction and you're not an elephant in the, in the, in the, in the you know, glass shop, etc. And these could also be complementary and they're not necessarily each agent has the same, but they're kind of on the same page with respect to complementary subsets uh, of, of, let's say the social protocols. And that means also the agents need to be information empowered, semantically competent. So the, the environment is semantically tagged, and of course the agents respond to that. That means that these, 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 these kind of the semiology isn't running idle. It actually makes a difference for, for the, 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 fu the fundamental performances of the spaces. And uh, then we're developing these agents have more complex decision uh, making processes, which we're learning also from the advanced gaming AI, and we working with our agents with utility functions. So they have a series of uh, considerations, uh, depending on close there are a number of options come to view, but they have also internal states and degrees of urgency with respect to various overall tasks they have to do. They interrupt the kind of minor tasks to move on to a major task, which is more important. And that is kind of a, a, a something we're learning is an element of, sorry, of, um, um, gaming AI and technology transfer. So we're focusing on, um, uh, we need to also then tailor these um, uh, models, the, the methodology to particular uh, domains. So it's different whether you do a retail environment or a corporate environment or kind of social, um, socializing, bar clubbing, whatever environment. And then particularly we can further tailor up to, to particular clients and, and really represent one-to-one -one their, their um, um, staff, for instance. Um, so, so this is the idea where we uh, also looking at more complex meshed and layered and dynamic environments rather than kind of a rigid three, four zone uh, 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 grid with, with without internal differentiation, this kind of uh, which also applies to cities you know, as we move from kind of the functional city to the, uh, let's say, parametric layered city, we also do that with respect to our buildings. And I'm going to show, we have actually worked on a number of projects uh, in this fashion. So one of them is a big technology center in Moscow, uh, you know, for, for spur banks. So, you know, as banks are more and more becoming technology and software companies with respect to all the tools there. And if it, uh, they're developing continuously is, 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 is that, so it's an open space, intervisibility, 
all territorializations are in the kind of semi-logical rather than physical, it's all open space, but highly articulated. We're raising corridors, we're doing step demarcations, ceilings, and we're having these kind of highly legible uh, it's circular and, and radial rather than kind of an, in, in a disorienting grid. And obviously it works across levels. So we have um, space, but also a furnishing and starting to populate and simulate with our agent models, uh, the interaction processes. And then we're starting actually to measure, uh, you know, encounter densities, frequencies, encounters with, between how and where encounters and how much of encounters are transformed into conversations and how, how, how are the various status groups involved. And we might want to know in terms of success criteria that for instance, managers get more interaction potentials that we have inter and uh, between teams, not only within teams, communication, et cetera. So we, 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 we can kind of measure that. So we're building up uh, uh, you know, the agents, we have, a, we have a kind of schema methodology to, to build them up and then run them and then populate. We can run hundreds and thousands of agents simultaneously with these. And then we, we can vary the, the, the layouts. In this building, it was too late to vary course and entrances, although it makes a difference, A3 and shortcuts, but we vary all the furnishing and the second layer of where we raise uh, circulatory versus, versus um, um, working territories. So and we're going quite into detail. You can see what we're trying to do here is also have kind of phenological legibility in these clusters to be maintained. That's another kind of sub aspect. Uh, um, what do you see? What do you perceive? We haven't operationalized that yet, but we're using our in own intuitions still to do that. But the whole process is moving our intu intuitive, um, let's say capacities as designers, which are irretrievable and uncommunicable, the inevitable into an operationalized systematicity. So we're doing systematic variation of these layouts and we run the test and we get quite significant differences in encounter densities and, and also in conversation, and let's say um, translation of encounters into conversations, et cetera. So, so differences in, in layout really make a difference. So we can prove also parametricism layouts are stronger uh, than, than, than let's say minimalist layouts, semi-logically enhanced and higher ordered environments make more uh, 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 deliver more essential functionality than kind of neutral and 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 kind of non um, uh, under in, less information rich environments and we can home in on the particulars and we can actually loop that into an evolutionary process and uh, we can also simulate and visualize it so we can have a visual control over the veracity and plausibility of some of these um, um, simulations and uh, we can also invite kind of first person perspectives in that and let the let the let the let the client kind of get a sense of this and view some of these and uh, the degree to which they find these plausible etc so i think there's a number of things as well as a lot of statistically withdrawing there's also an attempt of empirical calibration um, so i think we've we've moved and again we're bringing in a network graphs of the uh, of the um, um, corporate population in both to increase realism and to uh, home in on, let's say, targets uh, where we have communication deficits, which we, we do. So this is Spurbank. We're doing similar things for Infinitus in China, a major corporate campus under construction. And we've done similar studies here and run the, run the analytics and run the simulations. Um, so, and then we, we, we will show you that we have a lot of clients where, where we could bring this to bear. We're just starting that a recent tower we've done in, in Beijing. We also try to kind of make towers more atrium spaces, uh, intervisibility, less kind of barriers to communication. Oppo, a big technology company in Shenzhen, where we're developing um, these kind of larger floor plates. We populate them, atriums, views across uh, 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 sections, etc. And I want to show you that there's a kind of scope where we can bring these studies to bear and uh, but also with the intention here is to have that tool and develop and make that available in, in, a, in a larger kind of industry right and, and not just use within Zadid architects. So 
Um, and I want to now show that the, what, what, what fits within that is this idea of creative spontaneous environments, so an AI empowered environments, because when we model in Unity the, those, those um, human agents, we can equally model and, and, and give behavior and, and, and responsiveness and decision making processes to uh, robotic furniture, let's say, or architectural elements like partitions, uh, screens, doors, lighting, all of them become equally part of a, um, a interaction process. And we looked at, um, you know, this is a DRL series of projects which make an urban cluster. So we're also activating outdoor spaces, urban spaces, uh, and we, we run agents there and we, we designate and demarcate and, and semantically tag a lot of programming the urban space more than as usual. And you can see here that we're running, um, you know, these kind of configuration and reconfiguration, we have overlap, we have, um, um, and then so the social meaning of these transitions and changes. And then we can also, uh, you know, here we only illustrate that the, in, the, in the office, we, we, we actually measure and, and rank and, and optimize. So this is some of those, those um, um, projects where we have um, these architectural agents which are developed they have that kind of mobility characteristic. And we always look at it, what does it mean? What is when it reconfigures, what it is now inviting? How, it, how, how a, 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 a human agent is drawn into this? And it's not a remote control. I'm talking about creative spontaneous environments because these furnishing systems, this, the environment becomes itself anticipatory of what should happen. It is a learning machine learned and, and self-enhancing, um, you know, um, <clears throat> and um, learning uh, environment which, which makes these offerings because we, it, it would be impossible for humans to kind of remote control this. There needs to be a kind of spontaneous ecology of interaction between um, human actors, architectural agents, and that includes also the larger element. Uh, we, sorry about the music. Um, uh, so, so this is the, the project. And this one of the few hints where I want to take that next, because uh, because of COVID and all of this we were talking about was premised on close urban clustering in 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 in, in these kind of city fabrics campuses. It's all about interaction proximity. And now we're thinking that that some of these, since we have these models, and in our firm we do every single project uh, as VR experiences as well. We could maybe also think about how this interfaces and becomes virtual environments either. I'm talking about a kind of cyber urban incubators uh, where we, and, and this idea of cyberspace, by the way, was <laughs> when we first had the internet, this was the idea. So there's this great book by Michael Benedict as well. And I actually did in the, in the early 90s at Berlin TU, I did a, a virtual college project. We thought the internet might go cyber, it might go three dimensional, might be an architectural project or the architects rather than the graphic designers with magazine analogy and pages, which it became, but I think now we're transitioning maybe into that um, and virtual uh, interaction space. And I think they should kind of be seamlessly integrated and maybe overlaid with, with real spaces. So, so, but I'm just gonna look at, I mean, you know this stuff, I mean, Facebook is going into that and, and having these kind of virtual interaction space. And they, they're quite compelling and quite convincing how you layer, for instance, the kind of sort of virtual, uh, presences into the Facebook offices or how you start uh, opening up a screen, share video, things we'll be doing here on a grid with, with 10 spaces on a grid and the rest hidden, uh, where you had more of a layered and deep space hierarchies and you can approach and chat. And of course, this is something which exists in the gaming world. So there's another gaming world um, technology transfer, which I'm foreseeing. Uh, of course, we have Horizon coming up. You have these metaverses like um, um, a Decentraland or, or insomnium, sp insomnium space, which is here where you have kind of nightclubs and a lot of kind of not so much yet productive, re uh, you know, collaborative uh, uses, but I think we can see that there's an enormous potential. Uh, and, but also, it, you know, it, the, the, the pub experience after work is, is maybe as important as the, as the collaboration uh, during work, the, the after conference, you know, uh, socializing, etc. So we shouldn't dismiss it. But here we have a series of nightclub scenarios, insomnium space. We have the central land marketplace. We have, we have kind of, there's also real estate, location, location, location. And you can set up your, your stalls, your, your building, your offerings. There's events. 
There's of course the avatar creation. I mean, you know, some of you, most of you know that and that's what I'm getting into. Uh, these virtual events you're hosting and they're kind of space-based and, and avatar-based and VR-based, let's say, not necessarily with headsets. So that's what I'm looking at. And we're seeing now a, ser a series of businesses taking this out of the gaming world into the real world and we're doing these virtual substitutes like we're having now for serious work, you know, for, for fair trade shows combined with conferences where you can, you know, actually load up the 3D model and talk about it and have chats and, and so on and so forth. So, so, so there's a number of firms in getting into that space I'm just starting to look at a virtual events demo where you put up your stall and you look at the, a lot of this architecture also in these metaverse is, is very kind of claptrap a collage it is the very soon when these when these when these lands and spaces become valuable they will call on professional help they want to kind of mock up or draw down a kind of kitsch menu to place things they want professional designers created the digital um, uh, environment so you're moving from a kind of mom and pop shop to, 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 to a branded shop. So I'm just looking at this world and say, hey, we are ready. We can go in there and make a difference and we can use all the expertise. And this will be still parametricism. It will be creative and spontaneous. It will be agent-based. We can bring us ourselves as avatar. We can also kind of bring ourselves in as autonomous uh, uh, creatures who are, who are roaming around for us. Now, this is another one very interesting, confer or matic. This is a conferencing setting with chat zones and, and social zones and lectures and, and workspaces as well as with, uh, with the store. So there's a number of people. And now I'm looking what we're doing at the moment in terms of these incubator spaces, Unicorn in Chengdu, um, uh, Tencent, who is actually a gaming company, and we're doing uh, these kind of models already for them. Uh, we're de developing the, the, the technology campus. Why not at the head of building make a digital twin and run this into with additional capacities, of course, make it seamless, the corporate territory and their kind of virtual hosting territory. And some of those who are working from home or, or the clients who come in and visit, uh, they would have a similar environment. So we can really bring re real and virtual together and make our expertise take over the internet and take and not be kind of pushed out and substituted as real estate kind of investment shifts into the investing in these virtual spaces, but that's our core competency. All this is semiology and spatial semiology to, to facilitate navigation, legible interaction approaches as framing communicative interaction, real and virtual. So it's an ups, my project anyway, an architectural project implicitly is full on uh, to take that on and also integrated with, 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 with the real. I think the real, of course, will continue, and uh, but we will have that we will have that new layer and aspect, and that's why I want to bring this research project next. And I'm presenting that he has idea, and usually I should present, I mean, present uh, a completed works and not ideas, but I'm doing this here because I have the sense it's an open invitation for people who want to collaborate, want to help with expertise. I saw the previous speaker was talking about working in gaming, AI, uh, uh, game development. And there's an enormous opportunity to do more serious work than, than, than doing shooting games because the technology transfers beautifully. And it's already happening, by the way. I was talking to you, if you go to Fortnite, it's already a big hangout space. It's, you know, uh, that's where people hang out is a social media space and it is already productive. It's not just the, the distraction of shooting. You know, I was talking yesterday to a, to, a, to a CEO of a new startup doing avatars systems for Tencent and elsewhere. And he said he will used to hang out at the basketball court. Now he's hanging out in Fortnite, literally. So I think that's, that's my pitch and uh, please help because that's a big project we have. Thank you, Patrick, so much. Amazing, absolutely amazing presentation. And uh, as usual, amazing. Some of the most extraordinary architecture uh, of the last 30 years, I would say, the last three decades, uh, what uh, Zaha did and you produce.